Before we begin, a warning. This podcast mentions suicide. Listener discretion is advised, and if you need someone to talk to, text or call 1737. I can't put into words, and I'm really struggling to hold together right now, but it is, it's, it's a shock. It's come as an absolute shock. Just how it was communicated um, was very thoughtless and reckless. The lack of consultation with the community, with the wider disabled community, was really appalling, really, and um, yeah, we were all blindsided by it. There is just a million things that we have been able to do that have changed our adults and our children's lives that we can no longer do now. If uh, the Minister Penny Simmons came round to your house for a, a cup of tea and you had a chance for a face-to-face, what would you say to her? I would say I feel like you've set my house on fire. <laughs> These were the reactions to recent updates to so-called purchasing rules and equipment modification services for the disabled. The Ministry of Disabled People blindsided the community on Monday by immediately limiting access to a support fund for disabled people and their carers. They'll be making changes to the rules around what funding can be used for, including for carer support, and individualised funding which provides for things like sensory toys or devices to aid the non-verbal. After a media storm, Faikaha, the Ministry of Disabled People, apologised. We know that the way in which we went about announcing these changes caused stress and anxiety. And for that, I am sorry. But crucially, they haven't walked back the changes, despite criticism from the opposition and inside the government itself of the Disability Minister. Ultimately, the Prime Minister clearly doesn't have confidence in her. The Minister of Finance doesn't have confidence in her. And it is very, very clear that the people who are in the disability community don't have confidence in her. So her position is untenable. It was uh, poorly consulted and poorly communicated. And uh, it's right that she apologised for it, as did the Ministry. Kia ora, I'm Tom Kitchen. And today on The Detail, the story behind the Ministry of Disabled People funding debacle and whether the ministry has been designed to fail. Let's start with a brief overview of what happened. Here's Newsroom's Emma Hatton, who's written a lot about the disability sector. Faikaha put a post on its social media pages and updated its website to say that the purchasing guidelines had been changed. And what the purchasing guidelines are are sort of a list of criteria that people who receive certain disability supports can use to guide whether they are able to purchase something that they have received a support for. We'll come back to Emma later. But for now, Dr Rebecca Graham is the National Executive Officer at Parents of Vision Impaired New Zealand, And she has an 11-year-old daughter with disabilities. My daughter, when she was born, uh, we found out pretty quickly that she has what my husband terms bung eye-itis, which is actually a more effective term than anything I've ever used because people totally get it when you say she has a bung eye. And there's been a few additional uh, diagnoses since then and at the moment we use global developmental delay which is a catch-all term for children who have delay in two or more areas and will probably lead into an intellectual disability or learning disability diagnosis as she ages but uh, we don't know yet. And she has had disability funding I guess for years, um, mm-hmm. would that be right? Um, yes. What has historically, you know, in the last few years that funding been used for? Uh, it does depend on which funding stream you're under, which is why it's so confusing mm-hmm. for everyone. Uh, so carer support is the funding stream that most parents get. Carer support is worked out at $80 per day, and the maximum you can get is 50 days. Mm -hmm. And most people don't get the maximum. So if you can do some quick maths in your head, you'll figure out that's about, most people get around $3,000 from carer support a year. Traditionally, you could only use it to pay for a support worker. So you could only use it to pay for someone to come into your house and look after your disabled family member or use it to subsidise sending your disabled family member away to a respite care facility. That didn't work for a lot of families. 
I mean, I don't know how much you know about children, but a stranger coming into the house is particularly unsettling for children. Yeah. And yeah. and if you have a particularly if you have a disabled child that has medical needs, often you need a nursing type training or indeed a trained nurse to be able to administer the medications. So that meant that for a lot of parents, it actually was really unfit to meet their needs. For context, home support can cost. 30 to $50 an hour. Over time, especially under the last government, this kind of funding became more flexible. Instead of just being for a care worker, you could actually start using it for things that gave you as the carer a bit of a break. And so for some families, that meant buying a tablet or iPad or similar that had certain apps on it. So their child would you know, engage with a tablet and you could put it sounds terrible, put them on it. But, the, you know, you could have some structured time where your child was on the tablet and was engaged and was quiet and you could sort of get on and have a bit of a break. For other families, uh, they would use the care support for things like accommodation and travel because their uh, disabled child didn't like to leave the house or it was really difficult. So they would arrange for someone to care for their child and then they would also use the care support to pay for the accommodation and travel expenses so that they could actually have a good night's sleep away from the home. Right, so they could go to a motel or something yeah. instead of staying at the house. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it actually was brilliant for getting a good night's sleep and just having that kind of respite, rest that carers need. It wasn't generally used frivolously because there's not much of it. Um, and so you didn't get a lot of breaks. Okay, so those those are some of the examples of what the funding was used for. Uh, but then on Monday, the 18th of March, through Facebook and LinkedIn, as we now know, there was an announcement that things were going to change. What actually changed? What has changed is that there was quite a lot of flexibility, yep. and that was now gone. Completely. What was, that, what was that, some of that flexibility? So all the things that we talked about, parents that had been using their care support for different things, so that's gone. You can, as I understand it, only use it for to pay for a carer. In terms of the other things that people were using their individualised budgets for, uh, so parents who have a diabetic child have to get up in the night to check on them to make sure that they don't die overnight. It's a whole syndrome called dead in bed. It's it's horrific and stressful. And so some people were using their funding to pay for monitors. And these are $100 and you have to get a new one every 14 days. And so they were using that funding to, to pay for those so that they could get a good night's sleep and not worry that they'd wake up in the morning and find that their child had slipped into a diabetic coma and died. Okay. Um, you can no longer use the, no. the funding for that as it stands. So there, it's very rigid in what you can use it for. Yeah, very rigid. Uh, there has been a little walk back since, but it's still very confusing. What's the walk back been? Uh, there was an announcement towards the end of the week saying, oh, you can still use your funding for things that benefit the disabled person. Um, but you can't buy recreational devices. So it was a little bit of, uh, oh, we understand there's some things that perhaps might be good, but nothing that we think might be wildly extravagant. Okay, what do you mean by recreational <laughs> like, device? Yeah, I think what it means is you can't buy a laptop or an iPad or a tablet, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but you might be able to get away with purchasing an app and what is the impact of taking this funding away from these families who need it? Oh, it's, it's been horrendous. It hasn't been this grim in such a long time. Um, but because as parents we're so enmeshed in the system, it's so familiar to us, we recognise the language. As soon as we read the announcement, we knew that all of our supports were gone that we could not use our supports that we had the way we'd been using them. Um, some parents were really distressed. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but some of the announcements or follow-ups now have at the bottom of them links to suicide hotlines, oh. links to Lifeline, links to, you know, see your GP, call this number. 
And the reason that's happened is because of the enormous distress within the parent community. Oh, right. So, yeah, I mean, for, for someone like me reading these words, I don't understand, but you know the lingo, you know the language. Yeah. So it really does, ha- yeah, 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 yeah. I haven't touched on the changes to equipment and modification services. If you'd like to, please do, yes. <laughs> And this has taken me a little longer to get my head around because the detail wasn't updated to later in the week. Okay. Um, but what essentially they the Faikaha have done is they've implemented a priority system whereby if you are priority one, you will probably get funded for your equipment. If you're anything else, well, it depends. And what does priority one mean? Uh, priority one means that uh, if you need the equipment to stay alive, you'll get it. If you need the equipment to remain in employment or to be able to attend school, you'll get it. Um. If yeah, if you have pressure sores and are severely unwell and need the equipment to address, you'll get it. Right. So you can see we're dealing with the very basic level of need. Okay, so in terms of equipment, we're talking... Uh, I'm more familiar perhaps with the equipment that blind people use. So blind people use uh, canes. I think most people are familiar with canes. Um, But also use laptops that have software on them that do things like read screens out loud or read PDFs out loud. Uh, So... That sort of software is expensive and it requires quite a high spec uh, device to be able to run it. That is all now deemed not a priority. Right, so that, that's the cuts that have happened. There's been a little bit of a walk back. We've heard from, say, like uh, Minister David Seymour that maybe it has gone too far. I think the Minister for Disability has already said that that, that was a mistake. A person who uh, is living with a disability, whether they were born with it, whether they have had some sort of accident or event in their life. You know, I, I think we all have an obligation to help them. Uh, are you confident that something will, will change and something will go back to the way it was? I have to hope that things will get much better. And I have to have hope that you know the ministers will listen to our community and that they will go, oh, this needs to be done better next time. Mm. I Mm. am really concerned that people and the government, you know, ministers, genuinely thought it was acceptable to denigrate carers in the news the way that they have done. I, I... That has been really hard for our families to hear. We've got such broad criteria at the moment that the funding has also been used for massages, overseas travel, pedicures, um, haircuts for carers. That has left our parents feeling like they don't matter, that their needs don't matter, that their additional care work they do is somehow unimportant and unrelated to the well-being of their disabled child. Everybody was caught by surprise and it completely, um, I guess, took off. People were really upset. Back to Manhattan from Newsroom now. She'll take us through how this all came to a head politically. There were questions being asked, obviously, of the ministry and of the minister. Now, what we were trying to piece together from that point is sort of who knew what, when, and how had this come about and how had it been executed so poorly. So... Faikaha, they told the minister, which is Penny Simmons, about this on the 22nd of February, that they were having issues um, with their budget appropriation. Um, They said that they were getting really close to spending more than what they had been allocated in the budget. Uh, And so in order to make it to the end of the financial year, they would need to stop spending. And one of the ways that they decided to stop spending is by restricting what disabled people and their carers could purchase. So they told the minister about this on 22nd of February. What happened between the 22nd of February and 18th of March is a bit of a mystery. So Penny Simmons was asked in the House, in Parliament, um, in question time, multiple times if she had 
gone to Cabinet for emergency funding uh, to, to get them through so that they may not need to take such drastic measures. Um, mm-hmm. But she's not directly answered that question yet. She's just sort of said, you know, budget confidentiality and, and those sorts of very vague terms. Mr Speaker, there is a budget process that is in place. There's been no directness from the Minister about exactly how that timeline has transpired. So we've ended up with a decision made by the Ministry that in order to stick within its budget, um, it's had to make some changes, and this is one of them. There isn't a set process required to make this kind of decision, but Christopher Luxon says those decisions should go to Cabinet. All ministers on their portfolios need to bring forward to our Cabinet conversations around any changes to frontline services that are major and significant and that will impact New Zealanders. That didn't happen in this case. The minister has admitted that up front, uh, has learnt from that experience, and we're moving forward. The Minister of Finance, Nicola Willis, said that she was caught by surprise on this. Uh, you know, she did know that there were you know, some, some funding issues within Faikaha, but she didn't know how dire the situation was. Basically, there were murmurs and discussions around cost overruns before Christmas, uh, but there was an understanding that this was manageable, that the Ministry could manage the situation. Treasury advised me at that time that this could be dealt with through the usual budget process, And obviously, yesterday, it became clear there are more immediate issues. But this wasn't part of the government's drive to cut back off expenditure by 6.5%, you know, that public service cuts that they've been talking all about. Just this week, a total of 760 job cuts have been announced by the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Primary Industries and the Ministry of Business. Dozens more ministries are due to strip back their budgets as directed by the government. Apparently not. Apparently this isn't part of the the 6.5 to 7.5 percent um, cuts that all all departments and agencies have been asked to find. Um, this is about the ministry actually trying to stick within the funds it was allocated under the budget. So this is trying to save money for the money that it's already got, not trying to cut any deeper into that. And Penny Simmons isn't even in Cabinet anyway, is she? She's a minister outside Cabinet, so her influence uh, wouldn't be that extensive. Well, I mean, that's a that's a difficult one to say. I mean, no, she doesn't sit around the Cabinet table. Um, however, uh, the Finance Minister, Nicola Willis, did call her in for an urgent briefing um, after this all came out into the open um, and that has actually resulted in confirmation that the ministry uh, is going to be topped up with enough money to get through until the end of the year so that will obviously come out of um, the budget that's kind of a pre-budget announcement so to speak that doesn't change what has been adjusted with the purchasing guidelines. The Disability Issues Minister says restrictions on purchasing rules won't be lifted even with a top-up of funding. Penny Simmons says enough money has been given to the Ministry to get it to the end of the financial year. But she says even with additional funding, there's still a risk of the Ministry running out, so the restrictions will remain. That doesn't actually help real people on the ground who are Mm. worried about these purchasing guidelines at the moment. And what has also happened is that Willis has confirmed that Cabinet has decided that any further decisions now that this ministry makes about changing its criteria or its funds or anything like that needs to be properly consulted, properly sequenced. It actually needs to go to Cabinet before they then enact it. So basically, if this ministry wants to do anything from now on, it's going to have to get its minister, Penny Simmons, to take a paper to Cabinet, and then Cabinet will have to sign off on it. So that's quite a high level of oversight, quite a step up um, of what it's now going to have to do. It's lost some of its operational flexibility, I suppose. Um, What has also happened now as well is that uh, Penny Simmons must come to Cabinet with a terms of reference for a review into how this area is going to be managed in the future. So it sounds like they're quite serious about getting this right. Um, Nicola Willis said that she has been advised that for several years, actually, this is an area which the appropriations, so the amount that they've been given in the budget, has been outspent before the end of the year. So this would be prior to the establishment of Faikaha when disability support services were were within um, the Ministry of Health. So she is promising a significant uplift in funding at the budget. The 
Ministry for Disability Services uh, is expected to get vast orders of magnitude more and additional funding for frontline services. Exactly. How much um, is unclear at the moment. Yeah. And when you say that Nicola Willis says that the ministry is going to be topped up uh, until the end of the year, what does that mean? Because you're saying that won't affect the purchasing guidelines or the changes that have just been made. Yeah, I mean, the, the purchasing guidelines and the changes there are, are one part of what they have been changing to try and reduce costs. So they've been topped up um, in order to keep probably other operational aspects of the ministry running. I don't know what that actually involves, whether that's literally enough money to, to pay their staff until the end of the financial year, until they get their new budget allowance. Yeah, yeah. but it's been made clear that this top-up is not to reinstate the purchasing guidelines that were there before this change was made. I guess it gets a little bit tricky because the decision to reduce the flexibility of the purchasing guidelines is a, is a ministry decision. It's kind of an operational decision versus the funding, which has been decided by Cabinet. And I suppose Cabinet, you know, Nicola Willis or Penny Simmons could direct Faikaha to make these changes, but it doesn't sound like they're going to. But is this ministry even set up to succeed? Let's go back to when these more flexible spending rules started. During the pandemic, the government added flexibility to funding to make up for restrictions like lockdowns. What it meant was obviously people had greater flexibility to purchase more things than they were able to before, so people were spending more of their allocation than previously they did. So it wasn't that people were technically getting more money, but they were spending more money. Where it has hit a roadblock, obviously, is that there is just simply not enough money that has been allocated to the ministry to allow this to continue uh, because they either need more money or they need to reduce what people are spending their funds on because clearly what people are allocated for, if everybody spends their full allocation, there's not enough money for it. So yeah. the system in, in and of itself isn't set up to succeed because you do want people to spend the money that they have been allocated because it's been determined on a needs basis. This is money that people need uh, and they need it to purchase things to help them live their lives. So by relying in the past on people not spending all of the money that they had been allocated for, it was sort of a false economy that this was a sustainable model. The Ministry of Disabled People and before that Disability Support Services has always been underfunded. There has never been enough money um, for people to buy the things they need, for things to be done in a way that makes life accessible and better for disabled people. Yeah, well, it doesn't sound like the ministry has really solved these issues. It's only a couple of years old. Maybe it needs a bit more time. But if it's getting such bad press like this, you know, was it worth the change? Well, people wanted this change. They, they wanted a standalone ministry because they did see disability support as getting sort of swallowed up in the wider health system. Um, and the ministry as a standalone entity has only been around for a, for a relatively short period of time. But, but the people who were brought in to run this ministry aren't novices. They're not new people new to this. They were either working in disability support before this or they've had governance roles. I think the idea that this is somehow a new ministry and it's really green and we should just give them a free pass isn't fair. I think they know what they're doing and they should be working for the interests of disabled people. That's it for today. Thanks to our guests Emma Hassan and Rebecca Graham. The detail is funded through RNZ and NZ On Air. This episode was engineered by Jeremy Ansell and produced by Gwen McClure. I'm Tom Kitchen. Ma Tewa. Te